Well, thank you very much, uh, Derek. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. You're very kind. And, uh, and uh, since so many of Derek's friends are here today, let me take this perfect opportunity to say a few words about the man. Just kidding. <laughs> but no, seriously, I would like to say what a pleasure it has been, Derek, uh, to work with you as lead director of the Bank of Canada board. Yours is a very steady hand, and I appreciate your support and your mentorship. Um, it's really, uh, frankly, my wife Valerie is here today, so all my bosses are here today. Well, good afternoon to all of you. It's always a pleasure uh, to be here in Prince Edward Island, and it's, as you know, it's all about the people. Valerie and I just spent a delightful weekend here, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed some Ici, à Charlottetown, je prendrai mon discours en anglais aujourd'hui. Vous pouvez le consulter en français dans le site web de la banque. Et je serai très heureux de répondre à vos questions dans les deux langues officielles. You know, the Confederation Bridge has certainly simplified things when you're coming to the island since it first opened. And if you come to the island by car, you don't have to navigate the waters of the Northumberland Strait. I look this up. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, the shallow waters of the strait are susceptible to strong currents, tides, and turbulence. And even the most skilled sailor can find it challenging to read the wind and the waves and to judge all those cross currents. Now, if only the Canadian economy had a bridge like that. Now, we've been on a voyage of rebuilding since the Great Recession. But the trip has been longer and more complicated than previous recoveries because of all those cross currents acting on the economy. Not only are the headwinds of the global financial crisis still blowing, but now we're also dealing with lower oil prices, lower prices for other commodities, which previously were a key growth engine for us. Now, the implications for income and investment and the adjustments that that causes across sectors and across regions in Canada may take years to work themselves out. Now, the drop in oil prices is the most recent setback for the Canadian economy, but it's not the first time that we've had a shock that's had different effects from one region to another. Now, that's exactly what you'd expect in a large country that's rich in diverse commodities. And certainly, people working in the lobster fishery or mussels or oysters in those farming uh, sectors have seen their share of challenging periods in the past. But we all adjust. Companies have adjusted, and they've made quality improvements, and those kinds of adjustments are allowing aquaculture and the fishery to strengthen today as the U.S. economy recovers. Now, at the same time, PEI's exports are benefiting from another kind of diversification, which is into sectors such as aerospace and biotech, as well as diversification across markets, emerging markets, particularly Asia. Now, PEI's experience is a great example of the sort of resilience that we've seen in the past across Canada. And we're expecting to see it again as the economy continues on its way home toward what I call natural growth. That's self-sustaining, balanced growth at full capacity. Now, what I'd like to do today is to talk about how that voyage is going. Now, we don't have a bridge, so in fact, the economy can't avoid those choppy waters. But there are signs that we're headed in the right direction. Now, it's important for the bank to be very transparent about these signs, the signs that we watch. This is both because financial markets should make their own judgments about what we will do, and because our monetary policy works better when Canadians understand exactly what we're doing and why. So we begin the story with the Great Recession of 2008-09, which saw Canadian exports fall further than in any recession ever since World War II. Policymakers everywhere reacted aggressively to the global turmoil. Here in Canada, governments boosted spending, and the Bank of Canada cut its interest rates in steps until we reached the effective lower bound, essentially zero. Now, these moves, combined with the strong financial system, gave Canada one of the best post-crisis experiences among advanced economies. 
Now, it's fair to say that households, folks like you and me, did most of the heavy lifting to keep the economy growing. They borrowed to buy houses and to buy cars. We also enjoyed good growth in our energy sector because of those high oil prices. But growth that relies too much on low interest rates and households borrowing and spending is not sustainable. We kept looking for signs that a natural sequence was taking over in the economy. That would be a recovery in the United States and elsewhere would lead to stronger exports. And that would lead to higher business confidence, increased investment, and then employment. Ultimately, we would achieve natural balanced growth with exports being a much larger share of the economy and inflation sustainably at 2%. Well, exports began to recover after the recession, but they stalled in 2012 and 2013, despite strong U.S. growth. So we at the Bank of Canada did a lot of work to figure out what was going on. We looked at how the drivers of exports were evolving, including the competitiveness of various sectors and the loss of productive capacity during the, re the recession itself. We looked at 31 categories of Canada's non-energy exports, and we found that about half of those categories were underperforming relative to what we would expect, given the state of foreign demand and the exchange rate. So we dug a little deeper. We broke down those weak categories into about 2,000 specific goods or services. And we discovered that about 500 of those 2,000 specific goods or services had been shrinking since the early 2000s, since well before the financial crisis, and had fallen almost to nothing. So we're able to show that much of this drop was due to companies in these areas actually ceasing to operate here in Canada. So their productive capacity has been permanently lost to the economy. But what about the other half of that non-energy export sector? Well, those 15 categories are expected to lead the recovery in exports based on factors such as their ties to U.S. residential and business investment and their historical sensitivity to exchange rate movements. Now, this list of exports includes categories metal products, aerospace, pharmaceuticals, That's not to mention services, which of course includes tourism or education services, by the way. Now, if you think back to last summer, the economic outlook was looking pretty positive. The export groups that we had predicted that would lead the recovery were actually starting to perform as we expected. Meanwhile, the price of Brent crude oil was over $100 per barrel, and the global economy looked set to strengthen as economic headwinds were dissipating. The U.S. economy was looking especially good last summer. This was making us more and more confident that the natural progression I mentioned before was actually taking place and that we were on our way to solid, self-sustaining growth. Of course, we all know what happened next. The plunge in oil prices late in the year threw that recovery off course. And it was clear to us that the shock would be a net negative for the Canadian economy target. So we lowered our key policy interest rate in January. And you notice when I call it the key interest rate, I don't mean Derek key interest rate. <laughs> well, while it was clear that the oil price shock represented a setback, it has been no simple task to figure out how far off course it's taking us or for how long. From the data that we've seen to date, the impact began to show up in the closing months of 2014. For example, oil rig counts at West, in particular, began to fall right away. This showed up in employment statistics in the oil patch, especially in Alberta, but not only. Now, this impact contributed to weaker growth in housing and consumption spending. And manufacturing faltered as we moved into early 2015, partly because many of the inputs for the oil patch are manufactured, but also because of bad weather. Anybody remember that bad weather? and a temporary slowdown in the U.S. economy. 
So when all the numbers are in, we expect that output in the Canadian economy will have been basically flat in the first quarter, no growth. Now our view, as we set out in last month's monetary policy report, is that growth will rebound partially in the second quarter. Well, there's still a risk that lower oil prices could have a worse impact. The signs that we've seen to date lead us to believe that the impact of the shock is proving to be faster than we first expected, not larger. Meanwhile, the positive forces that we had already identified continue to build and actually should be buttressed by our interest rate cut and the lower Canadian dollar. By the second half of this year, we expect those positive forces to dominate the picture and have us back on track to reach full capacity around the end of 2016. So what are we basing this outlook on? Well, for one thing, the January interest rate cut is working. In an atmosphere where many other central banks, some 25 central banks, also loosened policy, the reaction to the cut made financial conditions in Canada significantly easier. The cut will benefit households with a mortgage, of course, though this will be partly offset by a reduction of income uh, for savers. But let me put it in concrete terms. Estimate that a household that has renewed, say, a $100,000 mortgage would save around $250,000. roughly $500 that the average household will save in gasoline costs this year. But the really big impact is for companies with existing export contracts, often in U.S. dollars. Now, they would see a bump in cash of roughly $15 to $20 billion over the course of this year from a $0.03 drop in the Canadian dollar. They'll also be in a much stronger position to compete for new export contracts in the future. In recent years, Canadian dollar have moved higher. We will need to carefully consider these and other economic and financial developments and how Canadian companies and households are likely to react in the months ahead. Now let's take a look at the categories of non-energy export goods that we said should lead the recovery. As a whole, this group, it adds up to about $185 billion. That's a lot of real money. It grew by almost 15% in nominal terms over the 12 months to March, 15% growth. Among industries that are present here in PEI, aerospace, 20% growth in the past year. Machinery equipment exports up 11% in the past year. Here in PEI, exports have climbed 22% in 2014, and now the total exceeds a billion dollars. Tourism, which is another industry very important both to PEI and Canada as a whole, has also had a good year. Tourism demand grew 4.5% to reach the highest level in a decade. And given low this year, now, what about the next steps in that sequence I talked about? That's the increases in company investment and employment. Well, when we spoke with executives in our most recent business outlook survey, we heard that companies that are benefiting from stronger U.S. demand are starting to feel capacity pressures. A growing share of exporters tell us that capacity constraints will limit their ability to meet a further increase in demand. Now, these constraints suggest that companies may need to step up investment. And to be sure, there is some spare capacity among the groups that we expect to lead the recovery, but outside of the energy sector, the outlook for investment spending is positive. In terms of employment, the last step in that sequence, there have been some recent signs that the labor market is starting to function better. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So we've seen long-term unemployment decline. And we've seen more prime age people taking part in the labor force, re-engaging. Employment vacancies have been trending upward since early last year. And that's suggesting that it's easier today to move jobs than before. And Statistics Canada survey of employment, payrolls, and hours, that shows that manufacturing jobs have been trending up for the past six months. Now, the bank's own indicator shows that there's still room to grow. There's still slack in the labor market, 
and we probably haven't seen the full impact yet of the oil price shock reflected in the employment data. But let me once mention one of my favorites, a bellwether, and that's firm creation. Well, part of the increase in business investment will be companies adding to their own capacity. Another part will be the creation of brand new companies. Historically, growth in the population of companies tends to be weak when the economy is weak and stronger when the economy improves. New firms, of course, are the prime creators of new jobs in the economy. They're also linked with high productivity growth because new companies are often the innovators, take advantage of brand new innovations to exploit niches and develop new products. New companies tend to be more productive than firms that have gone out of business and can pressure existing companies to become more competitive. So they contribute to the growth and productivity that's ultimately very central to improving our standard of living. Now recessions are painful and they require adjustments. Companies, and sometimes entire industries, can shut down, often never to return. But after the destruction, the new ones are born that help drive the next wave of growth. Now we know that we lost a lot, a lot of exporting companies during the recession. Growth in the population of companies hit a low point in Canada in 2009. This is similar to what took place in the U.S. and in the U.K. Now, after the recession, the number of U.K. companies started growing sharply in 2012. The U.S. population of companies took off in 2013. Now, the Canadian rebound hasn't been quite as quick as we'd like, but recent data have been more encouraging. We'll continue to follow these data very closely. Now, of course, these aren't the only signs that we look to along the way. We look at a wide range of economic data and supplement these with various surveys. We also consult with business leaders, and our regional offices are invaluable in those efforts. All of this information helps us make our best judgment about how much slack there is in the economy, or in other words, how far are we from home. And that brings me to inflation. Our judgments about inflation are truly important because they get to the heart of our mandate at the Bank of Canada. It's our job to promote the economic and financial welfare of Canadians, and the best way that we can do that is to provide an environment of low and stable inflation. Now, why is that? Well, it's because low and stable inflation allows consumers and businesses to make decisions about the future with greater certainty. And since the bank began targeting inflation almost 25 years ago, interest rates have been lower, and economic growth has been stronger, and more stable. So we know that inflation is fundamentally driven by how much economic slack we have in the economy. If the economy is operating below its capacity, that puts downward pressure on inflation. But inflation, it's a noisy indicator. All sorts of things can affect it on a month-to-month -month basis. Our task of judging the underlying trend of inflation has been complicated by these events of the past year. We have the oil price shock. That's pushing inflation down because of the price of gasoline. Then we have the weaker Canadian dollar at the same time, which, of course, pushes other parts of inflation upward. Now, on top of these, a number of one-off factors have, have been affecting inflation. And all of this has been, certainly made it much more challenging than usual to distinguish the trend from the temporary. And because it takes up to two years for interest rate movements to have their full effect on inflation, it wouldn't make sense for us to respond to every wiggle in the inflation rate. Our challenge is to look through the temporary effects and aim our policy at the movements in inflation that are persistent. And to do that, we need to make our best judgment of what that underlying trend of inflation is. And we have a number of measures that help us do this. And the most familiar of these is commonly called core inflation. It excludes eight of the most volatile CPI components, which are mainly food and energy, and it removes the effects of tax changes. We have a number of other methods, models, tools that help us make this judgment about the underlying trend. Now, next year, the bank will renew its inflation targeting agreement with the government. As we've been saying for the last few months, among the issues that we'll be looking at in this renewal process is whether we should continue to highlight one measure of the underlying trend of inflation, 
core? Or, and if so, whether our current measure of core inflation should continue to be the main one. At the most recent reading, total CPI inflation was 1.2%. Now that's well below our 2% target. This is mostly due to the drop in gasoline prices, which we treat as a temporary effect. Total CPI inflation, in fact, would be even lower than this. Actually, it would be quite close to zero if it were not for the exchange rate effects from the lower dollar and a few other one-time factors. Now contrast that with core inflation. Core inflation, which of course excludes gasoline and other things, was 2.4% latest. But it's being boosted by those exchange rate effects I mentioned before and these one-time effects such as meat prices and communications prices that cause it to be volatile. Uh, you can tell that's a lot of moving parts, and I could go on all day about this. I really could. Uh, but the impact of each of those transitory forces has to be estimated by our staff. We can't just measure them. And so we have to use a lot of judgment to gauge the combined impact. And those estimates, of course, have a large degree of error. But our current best judgment is that the underlying trend of inflation is somewhere around 1.6 to 1.8%. Now, to get that trend moving back towards 2%, which is our target, it's essential that the excess capacity in the economy get used up. With growth set to accelerate over the rest of this year, the underlying trend should eventually converge with total CPI inflation at the 2% target when the economy returns to full capacity. So here's the bottom line on our voyage. We're still a ways from home. We project it will take 18 months or so to get there. And that's only if growth turns out as we expect. That's if we aren't hit by other storms or cross currents on the way, whether they're headwinds or tailwinds. But our best judgment is that we should get home at full capacity with inflation sustainably at 2% around the end of 2016. So let me conclude with a few words about what home will look like when we do get there. We've been away from home for quite a while. While some companies disappeared during the Great Recession, never to return, others are emerging in new industries. At the same time, the economy of the future will be shaped by demographic forces that have been decades in the making. The retirement of the baby boom generation, folks like me, is affecting the economy's growth potential. This is one reason why growth will be slower in the future than we became used to during the baby boom generation. And it's why, one of the reasons why, interest rates will probably remain lower than they did in the past, longer term. Recent events make it clear that we live in a very uncertain world. Navigating the waters of the global economy is always challenging. You never know when a sudden storm will emerge to blow us off course. And that's why at the bank, we take a risk management approach to monetary policy. We look at all these data. We derive from the latest models, the latest tools. We supplement these with intelligence from companies, survey data. Ultimately, though, we make judgments, both about the degree of economic slack in the economy and the implications for our goal of inflation control. By being transparent about the signs we're watching, we're trying to help financial markets make their own judgments about the economy's prospects. These opinions are very important because they serve as a useful check on our own analysis. Now, it's been a long voyage and it isn't over yet, but you can be sure that the Bank of Canada will continue to work toward bringing the economy home at full capacity with inflation sustainably on target so we can fulfill our mandate to support the economic welfare of all Canadians. And thank you all so much for being here today. It's about time we met. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Governor Polaz, we'll now take questions from the audience. Media are asked to reserve their questions for the press conference that is scheduled for immediately following this luncheon. That's happening at 1.30 in the Langevin Tilly Room.
Okay, as you've probably noticed, we have two mics set up in the room today. For those of you that are going to ask questions, we do, I'm going to say, insist that we do use the microphones. And before your question, please state your name and the company that you represent prior to your questions. All right, we've got 10 minutes. And who's got the, que the first question for Governor Polas today? One at a time now. My name, is, my name is Blair Corkum, uh, Blair Corkum Financial Planning. Towards the end of your speech, uh, Dr. Pola, as you mentioned about um, baby boomers and, and our generation uh, having an impact. One of the um, concerns I have, I guess, is as, as retirees move into um, in those uh, retirement years, the interest rates on investments, uh, you know, we're looking at retirement years, we're looking at more conservative investments, of course, interest income rates are low, inflation rates, uh, uh, inflation rates and interest rates are quite similar. And I guess I'm just looking down the path, uh, you know, and, and I'm not looking for predictions from you here, but, I, but will things, you know, you look at 50 year rates of return and interest rates are 3% more than inflation and things like that. Are we ever going to get back to those days or should we be planning much more conservatively? Right. Well, that's an excellent question. And I know that, uh, that it affects a lot of people, that question. So, uh, so we'll, we'll just spend a minute on it. The, uh, the, what we call the equilibrium rate of interest, that's a long-term concept that the economy converges on. Uh, what we know is that equilibrium has been uh, changed by this demographic effect you're mentioning. The ingredients that go into our interest rates are really two. That's the real growth, the long-term trend growth rate in the economy, possibly the global economy as opposed to our own, um, and uh, the rate of inflation. So just adding those two up gets you a pretty close kind of guide to uh, what things will look like. Now, we got used to growing at 3% or more in Canada over the last 30 years as an average. Um, that average is drifting down because the labor force uh, participation is, drag is coming down as people in my age group start to retire. So as that happens, we think that growth in Canada will converge on something below 2%, say 1.8 or something like that. And similar in the United States, very similar kind of argument, more like 2% there, but anyway, close enough. So if you add on our inflation target of 2%, long term, you kind of have your eye on something that's getting close to 4%, perhaps, for bond yields, that sort of thing. But that's a lot, very long-term notion, and a lot has to happen for us to get home, as I described before, plus all the headwinds that I've talked about need to go away, too. So um, when people write me, they often do. They say, gosh, you're keeping interest rates really low, and I'm, having, I'm struggling, you know, as a retirement, uh, I'm a retiree, you know, I'm, I'm living off interest and so on. And I ask them, I say, I understand that, but you need to understand that we cut interest rates like this in order to stop something really bad from happening. Um, you know, it's always obviously hard to talk about a counterfactual, but most of us believe that we averted the second Great Depression. In that 2008-2009 period of frenzied activity by central banks and governments, uh, we averted it. But you know, when you look at the U.S. economy growing at two, or like probably get up to three percent, that kind of thing, um, it's doing it with zero interest rates. So you know that there's still big headwinds pushing against it. It's like pushing something up a hill or something. So we aren't home, and the conditions have not returned to normal. So all we, all we really know is that uh, we're headed for a different destination from the one we started at back seven, eight years ago. And uh, I, ask, I ask retirees to think about how bad the retirement plan could have looked like if, if we had the second Great Depression. Uh, you know, we're far better off than we would have been. Uh, but I know that doing that math for around retirement planning is difficult these days at these low rates. Absolutely true. We're confident that we're headed the right way. So uh, it's, not, it's not a forever thing, but it's, it's definitely hard work still. Now, I hope there's a, a happy question now. <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> oh, next question. Uh, Mr. Paulus, uh, Steve Logie, Maritime Electric. Um, I wonder if we could go back to your comments about the interest rate cut, the Bank of Canada's key interest rate cut in January. And uh, 
I believe you would agree that it caught the financial markets generally by surprise. And I wonder if you could expound or provide some insight into the Bank of Canada's policy as it relates to uh, forward guidance for the markets and, and how you view that as a bank. Okay, well, it's a good question. It's true that uh, even though the oil price shock was as very visible to everybody and everybody could, uh, could make a guess that it would be a negative thing uh, for the Canadian economy, uh, it was hard to put a gauge around how negative it might be. And as we approached uh, the January decision, oil prices actually were still falling and it wasn't clear where they might even stop. Um, in fact, uh, the day we made that interest rate cut, uh, oil prices were already $10 lower than what we had assumed in the forecast that we were putting out at the time. So I don't mind telling you that was, that was a, an odd feeling. Uh, that's why we called it insur an insurance cut, because we weren't sure how things would turn out, but we were pretty sure that some cushioning for the economy would be a valid thing to do. And ordinarily, we don't like to uh, surprise markets. Usually markets can anticipate what we'll do because they look at the same numbers that we look at. And as uh, nobody knows, we were a little bit in front of that at that time. There was no way that forward guidance could have helped us in that sense uh, because it was time to act. And now when we look back on a quarter that probably will be a zero quarter, zero growth, I think it's good for us that we had the cushion in place then as opposed to waiting another few months and seeing how bad it was before we acted. So uh, when you see a shock, it's, and our job is not to, not to guess these things, but in fact to if, if I manage the risks around the outlook for inflation. So when we get to that point, we know that inflation, as, as driven by the output gap or the capacity in the economy, would be downside risk. And we're already well below target. Then it's our job to do this. Now, in the, in the world, when you get into a world where everything's back to normal, which, of course, I, I realize we're a ways away, but in the normal state of affairs, Mother Nature creates shocks every day cross-currents, as we discussed, every day. And it's the central bank's job to protect the inflation target and beneath that, the performance of the economy from those shocks. And so those shocks have to land somewhere. And where they land, historically, is in the financial markets. So in the sense that we're going back to normal, we're going to get back home over the next couple of years, financial markets are going to have to get used again to that world in which Mother Nature dishes it up and it'll be the financial markets that deal with it. It won't be the central bank in that sense. So uh, I think this process of getting back to normal is going to be, it's, it's the first time we've done this. Obviously, we're in uncharted territory, and we're all going to learn a lot more about how this works. Yes, sir? One last question. Thank you. Um, Rory Francis, Prince Edward Island Bio Alliance. Um, I guess we, we all have negative questions because we, we're very happy that we have you worrying about all these things on That's our behalf. That's it. So it's my job to worry. You're, you're, you're a Just to rest <laughs> easy. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this worry is so related to Canada's uh, preparedness to be competitive in the export world, uh, and Prince Edward Island being a, a, an exporter, uh, certainly is uh, how we make money here. Uh, more open trade agreements in the world, uh, more coming our way. Uh, some concerns about whether or not we have the tools in Canada when we look at how other countries are managing their currencies in a way that seems to be uh, uh, creating sort of artificial competitiveness when it comes to being uh, in that export uh, market or not. Um, and whether we have the tools to, to be competitive in an export uh, market with more open trade agreements, um, and are we ready? Uh, are our companies ready? Are we ready in Canada to be competitive in a more open trade environment? Thanks. Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, uh, no, nobody really can manage an exchange rate uh, in order to promote their companies. You know, if we were to try and do that, what would happen is the inflation rate would adjust uh, with, without us controlling it, you know. And then underneath that inflation rate would be the wage costs and so on. So if you had a lower, if, if you had a lower exchange rate, inflation would go up and your costs would go up and you wouldn't be any more competitive and vice versa. Uh, 
just as we saw when the dollar rose, it made, made us uncompetitive. But what happens then is inflation is held down, your costs get more under control. So these things, uh, that's why we say we don't really have choices in all these things. We choose the one thing that matters the most, and that's the inflation rate. That's the anchor that gets us from place to place and helped us so much like during the crisis. So having that inflation target front and center and people believing in it meant that the economy weathered that storm incredibly well. But a storm it was. And so what do I, am I optimistic? I am, actually. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because we talked about the 2,000 products, and, you know, 500 of them are, are gone, and we went through a media database with those keywords, and we'd find the article, so-and-so closes their doors, so-and-so moving to Mexico, those kinds of things. Uh, so we know that that's gone. Uh, but what, is, what happened to those who survived that was they did a lot of great cost cutting through that. And we know they didn't invest that much. We know they're ready to invest now. And what we can see in the data is a very strong increase in Canadian productivity that's happening over the last 12 months. And I believe that's because the demand is rising and companies are now getting the fruits of all that hard work. And they haven't started much hiring yet because they're not ready to expand but they're very close to that point. That's that natural sequence I talked about. So when they do expand, what will happen is they'll be updating everything. Every time you invest in something new, your whole process is more productive. And so I think that we're on uh, the leading edge of a very positive story for that. And we won't be doing it on the shoulders of a weak currency. That's not the point. The currency moves around when the, uh, when the oil price moves around. We have to accept that as business people here in Canada. Uh, that, that, that signal told us for years to invest more in the oil sector, and now it's telling us to invest more in the non-oil sector. And I'm confident that those signals are operating and people are doing it. Uh, we can see it in the numbers, and it's just a matter of when it becomes the dominant trend, which we think will be the second half of this year. And the most important thing for me is, though many of those holes that we see now will be filled with brand new companies. And right now, you could name 10 things that we export today that five years or 10 years ago, we never even would have thought of. They're just things you just never knew we would, we'd come up with. And it's that kind of stuff which is our future. Companies that are lean and ready to grow and brand new companies that create new productivity out of thin air. Uh, that do dual process is the creative part of what Schumpeter called creative destruction. We've only been living the destruction part, and here comes the creation part. It's going to be good. Thank you so much, Governor Polaz. And I'll now call upon Stephen Cudmore, partner with Richardson GMP and our luncheon sponsor today, to formally thank our guest speaker. Honorable Lieutenant Governor Lewis, Honorable Premier McLaughlin, uh, their worships Mayor Lee and Mayor Dumphy, Chief Justice Jenkins, uh, Justice Key, Mr. Key, and distinguished guests. Governor Polos, it is my honor to bring thanks to you for being here with us today. Uh, as you know, the financial markets have a tendency to hang on your every word, so I'm going to avoid the temptation to paraphrase your message. Uh, I dare not do that, uh, but I would like to say the message that you shared with us has been insightful and very encouraging. Uh, and it becomes apparent to me uh, as the interconnectivity of the global economies becomes increasingly more complex, the work that you and your board do to keep our economy strong and stable for the benefit of all Canadians is more important than ever. So, Mr. Polos, on behalf of the Greater Charlottetown Area Chamber of Commerce, and indeed all of us here, thank you for guiding the monetary policy of our country. And thank you. All right, thank you so much, Stephen, and of course, Governor Paul. ...conclude the Greater Charlottetown 